Hello, church. Hello. Yeah. Good to be with all of you this morning here in Fremont, or if you're online or one of our other campuses. It's just good to be together, right? Is Oh, no? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad to be here. Hopefully, you'll get on board. Uh, we are, we've been in a series uh, that started last week called Red Letter Invitation. And what we're doing in this series is we're actually looking at the different invitations that Jesus gives us that are, in many of our Bibles, uh, highlighted in red. And, and some of you maybe learned that last week, that where you see red in the New Testament, those are the words of Jesus. And some of our Bibles have that, some of them don't. Mine actually doesn't. Uh, just a fun fact for the morning that you get for free. Um, but last week, Pastor Edward talked about being, uh, finding rest. Do you remember that last week if you were here? Finding rest in the work of Jesus and who Jesus is. And specifically, uh, the passage or the invitation from Jesus was, Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and I will give you a yoke that is easy. And so many of us last week, uh, we, the, the Lord did some incredible work in our life, and we responded to this invitation. And many of us last week came before the throne of God and placed our burdens before him and said, I'm not able to carry these. I don't have to carry these. In fact, you invite me to put these down. I'm going to lay these burdens at your feet because I want to enter into that kind of a rest. And again, many of us responded to that invitation last week. And what we're going to look at this week is in Mark chapter 8, and Jesus gives us another invitation that will feel heavy, that will feel possibly like a heavy burden. And what I hope that we see is that when Jesus gives an invitation, it actually is much it's actually an intimate invitation to become something and not just to do something. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 8. If you're new to the Bible, uh, Mark is in the New Testament. It's the second book of the New Testament. And it was written by a guy named, that's right, Mark. Good, Mark. And so if you have your Bibles in Mark, we're going to be in, starting in verse 34. So if you have them, go ahead and stand to your feet for the reading of God's word. Beginning in verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul. And this is God's word for us this morning, and you may be seated. Now, an invitation like last week to come all who are heavy laden, everyone raises their hand. That's, that's an easy invitation to accept. You're going to, you're going to relieve me of the burdens of life and everything that I'm carrying? Absolutely sign me up. But now we come to this invitation in Mark 8, and Jesus starts talking about taking up your cross, denying self. This certainly is a much heavier invitation, and it might even feel contradictory to what Pastor Edward talked about last week. And one of the challenges with Christianity for the last 2,000 years is making mistakes or misinterpretations or misunderstandings of what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian. And on the one side, you might have uh, people who see Christianity and believe that Christianity is saying yes to Jesus, getting your passport stamped to heaven, and then just doing whatever you want. Just live your life. I'm going to heaven. I said the prayer. I went to the thing. I walk forward. I'm good. I'm done. I'm on my way. And then the other side is, well, uh, if you're a Christian, man, it's a lot of hard work. And man, you can't go to the movies and uh, you, you have to go to church every Sunday, twice, if you're a real, real Christian. You know, you go to church, you just come back. You find something. You go to both services. Uh, you are reading your Bible and nothing else. Um, I mean, it's just, it's a list of to-dos. And, 
And, and so you have these, a lot of times you have these two veins of Christianity and you're asking the question, well, which one is correct? Because I want to be on the right team. And I would say both of these are incorrect. And both of these ways of understanding Christianity actually are missing huge pieces of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so what we want to do this morning is we want to understand this invitation because what Jesus is doing in this invitation is he is inviting people to be his followers. Did you catch that at the beginning? If anyone would come after me, meaning anyone to be his followers, we're going to become, we're going to be with Jesus, become like him, do the things that he would do. And he actually explains what that looks like. For us this morning, as we open up this text and go through, we're going to be looking at primarily three, three different things in this passage. First is the cost of discipleship. Second is the price of the world. And then finally, the payment for life. Cost of discipleship, the price of the world, and the payment for life. Here's the cost of discipleship. Uh, quick context in Mark 8. You know, Jesus is at the height of his popularity, Okay, he's been cruising around for about a year now. He has been feeding people, you know, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. He's been healing people of their diseases. He has been, he's been going rounds with the religious leaders and knocking them around uh, quite successfully, right? So the people love him. He absolutely love him. And who wouldn't, right? Free lunch, might sign me up, maybe, right? Like that's, that's a... People, that's why he has these followers. He's meeting at, this, at the moment. He's meeting immediately their, their felt needs. And so then he gathers his disciples together right before this passage. And he says, hey, who do the people say that I am? And they give the right answers. And they give the an- they, all good answers. People say you're Elijah. People say you are the coming Messiah. You know, they're saying all these good things. And then he says, well, who do you think that I am? And Peter stands up. He says, oh, man, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You know, and he thinks that he's got the A answer. And that's the right answer. That is the right. It wasn't a wrong answer. But Jesus, I think, wants to speak to what it means to not just be on board and be a part of the fan club of Jesus. Not just to say, I really like the things of Jesus. But actually answer the question, what does it look like to actually follow And so he says this, calling the crowd. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Three specific things. He says to, first, he says to deny himself. The person who would follow Christ must deny himself. The word deny here is the same word that's used to describe Peter when he denies Christ. And so the word that Peter, that Jesus uses here is going to be a future word of, of denial. It's going to be a future word that's describing Peter when he said, I, I have nothing to do with Jesus. I'm not on his team. I don't know the guy. That same level of pushing away. A denial of self, here, here's what it basically breaks itself down this way. A denial of self is saying all of my agendas, all of my dreams, all of my plans I lay at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, have your way in my life, not my way. Let thy will be done, not my will. Now this goes against uh, the way that we kind of process and think in our world because so much of our world is, hey, have dreams, have big dreams, big plans, get yours, get the fat stacks or whatever the kids say, right? Like, going after everything what you want to make you successful in life. And many of us, since we were very young, we've been on a pathway, right? We've been on a pathway to great career, great family. And I want you to understand something. I'm not saying, and Jesus is not saying, that having plans and dreams are a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. But self-denial is this. God, I have plans that I have for my life, but I lay them at your feet. Why? Because yours is better. Yours is better. And I may not even understand it. And I may not even like it. But yours is better. And we lay our plans and our dreams at the feet of Jesus. Self-denial is also rejection of our own self-righteousness. And inherent in the reality of self-denial is the affirmation that you and I cannot 
can not, do not have the ability to earn any good favor with God. It is not possible. God does not have like a select group of Christians that were able to muscle up enough spiritual energy to prove that they're serious, to prove that they're on board. Self-denial is a rejection of our own self-righteousness. One of the biggest problems with self-righteousness, other than its damning nature, is that it makes all morality relative. Because if, you know, how many people are, are here or at home or, or even just alive on the planet? Like, we all have a different system for what is good and what is bad, right? Like, we all just create that in ourselves. And so what self-righteousness does is we, we easily go down a path where I justify my actions and I will justify my unrighteousness because I'll say, well, I really need, you know, something as simple. I mean, what's tomorrow? Everyone's favorite day, tax day, right? Right? Or how are you celebrating this year, right? And, tomorrow, and like we will justify not paying certain taxes or fudging a little bit or we'll figure out TurboTax, how to like, how to kind of crank it up, you know, you watch the numbers go up, right? If you do that, I don't know, maybe you do, don't do your own taxes, right? But my point is we will justify anything and someone else might say, oh no, you can't do that. But why do we, why do we have that difference? Because self, in a world of self-righteousness, everything is relative. And you decide, I decide, what's our favorite saying? You do you. That's self-righteousness. That's self-righteousness. And self-denial is a rejection of that. And self-denial is also a repentance of sin. And we've talked about repentance before, but the gospel call to self-denial necessitates repentance from sin and selfish ambition. Those who follow Christ must do so on his terms, not ours. We must be willing to completely break from our former way of life, completely break and become the new person. He also says this, the second thing that Jesus describes when he says, you know, to come after me is to take up your cross. Take up your cross. What does it mean to take up your cross? What is this cross that Jesus is talking about? Now, oftentimes we'll use the phrase, oh, that's just my cross to bear. And what we normally mean by that, and I'm not, I'm not digging on anybody or anything, but what we normally mean by that is some sort of hardship or trial. Um, you know, my, you'll say something like, oh, my mother-in-law, that's my cross to bear. Or, <laughs> or, uh, or you know, um, I just, I, I'm, I'm only, you know, five foot ten. I'll never play in the NBA. That's my cross to bear. I can't write six foot on my driver's license, so that's just my cross to bear. And I'm trivializing it, and I don't mean to do that, but the point is, like, we will, we will think of some hardship or trial in life, and we'll call that our cross, call that our cross to bear. The problem with that is I would not trivialize the cross of Christ to you. A cross comes from specifically walking in Christ's steps, embracing his way of life, It comes from bearing a disdain from the world because we are embracing the way of Jesus, not the way of the world. It comes from living out the business and the sexual ethics of Christ in the marketplace. It comes from embracing his way, not ours. And taking up your cross means an expectation of suffering an expectation of suffering. Jesus' point was that those who desired to be his disciples, rather than seeking prosperity and comfort and ease, must be willing to endure persecution, rejection, even martyrdom for his sake. It's no wonder why Jesus would say in John 15 that if the world hates you, you know that it hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. And this is teaching us that the cross means and implies social rejection. I hate to break it to you, but being a follower of Jesus doesn't put you in the cool kids category. It just doesn't. 
it's impossible for us to be the cool kids. Like, we're not supposed to fit in with the way of the world. You know that? You're su- we should feel it when we see friends, family, coworkers, uh, neighbors, whatever it is, when they're living their life according to the way of the world, and this isn't judgment against them, I'm just saying when you see the way that they're living their life, and in your mind and heart, you say, but that's not the way of Christ. And I feel the pull towards that. And I want to fit in so bad. I want to be accepted. But if I go against that, whatever it is, I'm going to be socially rejected. That's taking up your cross. Let me give you a few examples of this. Your career is not a vehicle for your personal success and flourishing. As a Christian, your career is a vehicle for God to use you through the gifts and talents that he's given you so that you might make a difference in the world, not just with the people who you work with, but in the community that you work in. God has put you in that office, in that yard, in that classroom, in that whatever it is, not so that you could be successful and climb the ladder, but because God wants to use you to be a blessing to others. God wants to use you. Some of you are in incredibly influential positions in your companies. Do you know that God puts you there, not for you? And maybe you could steer the culture of that company to to bring light and life into the world. Do you realize that? How about our wealth? God does not give you or withhold from you wealth so that you can either celebrate your success or complain about your station. That if God gives you wealth and provides a more abundant than you need, that's him saying, hey, I've given you extra so that you might use it for my glory in the world. To, to fund missionaries, to, to help in things that are going on, on here at the church, to bless a poor family in your neighborhood. Or if God withholds wealth from you, do you know what that is? That's not like you messed up. That's God saying, I want you to trust me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm, I'm going to take care of you. If I, Jesus says to his disciples, you know, you know how to give good gifts to your children and you're a sinner. How much more does your heavenly father know how to take care of his children? And do you talk to people who, who don't have a lot and have this deep explosion and just lava level faith? Like they're just burning with faith and joy. And they're like, I have no idea. I, I talked to a brother once and he, he was telling me a story about when, as, when he was uh, in, in school, he literally didn't know where his next meal was gonna come. He didn't buy the meal plan or anything like that. And he said, I don't know, but God will provide. And every single day he ate. I didn't know how I was going to pay for the next semester. And every semester, God provided. And, I'm, and, and, and you, couldn't, you, you couldn't find a frown on this guy. My point is, whether we have wealth or not, that's a matter of, that's a matter of God providing, and, you, and that wealth doesn't belong to me. And finally, like Jesus because we choose to live out the way of Jesus and pick up our cross and follow him, some people are going to want to kill us for it. Now, I know where we live, and I know that in America we have the freedom of religion and we have uh, protections, and I'm, I think those are good things. I'm not against those in any shape or form. However, I do know that we have brothers and sisters all over the world who right now are in danger for their confession of Christ. Physical danger because they love Jesus and they desire to follow him. And I'm, this is not me being uh, like a doomsayer or a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but I don't know how long those protections are gonna be for us. Oh, there's nothing that says it's gonna be like that forever. So, we must look at our Savior and go through, Lord, if it costs me my life, I would follow you. 
Not every believer will die as a martyr, but every faithful follower of Christ is to love Jesus so fully that not even death is too high a price for eternal joy. So we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and finally we follow him. The word follow here that Jesus uses has a connotation of fellowship. So it's not just this idea of Jesus saying to his disciples, all right, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me, you know, like your kids walking behind you in, in Safeway or whatever, right? And they're just like pulling stuff off the shelf everywhere. It's not like that. The kind of follow that Jesus is talking about here is the kind of follow where, hey, let's go together. It's fellowship. It's let's, let's go on this road, let's go on this journey together. And see, what, <coughs> excuse me, what these things do, deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow after him, these things shape us into the kind of person that Jesus wants us to be. Like these are not just arbitrary weights that he puts on us to ruin our day and ruin our life, that these things actually are meant to, to allow us in, to step into flourishing. Because again, if we believe that God's way is the best way, then we would do well than to listen to the person who followed God's way perfectly and do what he did, right? I think Jesus, I think he knows what he's talking about. And so we have this, uh, basically what it boils down to is this complete and total surrender of the self. Complete and total surrender of the self to be a follower of Jesus. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells a parable about the kingdom of heaven being like a man who finds this invaluable treasure in the middle of a field, right? And for somehow nobody else knows about it. And so it says that he, 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 gives, he surrenders everything in his life, all of his money and his wealth, everything, so that he can buy this field because if he has this field, this, this treasure in it is more valuable than anything he had before. And so he gladly lets go. And in this story, Jesus is saying, I'm the treasure. I'm the treasure that's more valuable than anything else in the world. And the more we understand that, the more we understand the cost of discipleship. That we lay everything down in order to get Jesus. Because the alternative is, pray, excuse me, is paying the price of the world paying the price of the world. This is the contrast to the cost of discipleship. And rather than being completely surrendered to Jesus and having his will wash over us in every aspect of our lives, we don't surrender to him, we surrender to paying the price of the world. And there's many parts of the scriptures that talk about the binary nature of human beings where we are either devoted to God in our life or we're not devoted to God. That the, it's actually just one or the other. Now, some of you here might be, you're, you would say, okay, Jay, but what about me? Because, you know, I'm not against God per se, but I'm searching, you know, I'm asking questions. I have, my, I have questions, I have doubts. You know, I feel like I'm on a journey right now and I'm like, awesome. Keep asking questions. Keep bringing your doubts before God. He's a big God. He can handle it. Uh, keep asking the Lord to show himself to you. Like those are, that's a great, those are, that's a great pathway to be on. But I want to make it clear that that's not a separate category of people. That the Bible still talks about we're either devoted to God or we're devoted to God the world and ourselves. And Jesus gives a definition and ex explanation. The first way that we see this is we have a desire to save ourselves, save our life for ourselves. Verse 35, whoever would save his life, whoever would save his life will lose it. The general ploy uh, of, of radical individualism and narcissism is that everything in life is meant to be about you for your glory, your comfort, and your flourishing. And the, th this, this way of saving, the, saving this life for ourselves, it has the idea that I need to get as much happiness out of this life as possible. And the general sense is that this is all there is. I mean, that's where it comes from, right? 
that this world, the physical, is all there is. There's no spiritual realm. There's no afterlife. There's no God. This is it right now. And so we need to, we need to be as happy as possible right now. And if I'm not happy, then something's wrong. And we do this to the detriment of our own souls and even those around us. I'll give you a couple examples of this. Why else, this one might hurt a little bit, but I want you to know I love you. Why else would we shove a device in the face of our kids to shut them up? When all of the research says, don't do that, that, that these devices are rewiring their brain and stealing their childhood. All of the research says that. Why would we still do it? Because I need, I need a minute. I, I need peace and quiet. Now, is this me stepping on anybody? No, but I love you so much, I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear. Why else would we flirt with someone who's not our spouse? Why else would we do that? Except that, you know, I, I just, I, it makes me feel good, makes me feel wanted. You know, I'm not getting what I want at home. And so I'm just, you know, don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's just emotional or it's, it's no big deal. I have it under control. But even though there are innumerable examples of just casual, innocent flirting led to something destructive. Why else would we hide in ourselves and never let people in and never be vulnerable and only our friendships are just surface level? No one really knows who the real me is. Why else would we do that? Except if we just said, well, it's just easier that way then I don't have, then I don't, I'm not putting myself out there. I've been hurt before. It's just better. I can control the situation if it's just me. See, when this life is just mine for the saving, then all I'm going to be focused on is that and to live my best life now. And if my desire is to save this life for myself, then I am going to collect and take all of the worldly gains possible before I die. Verse 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? The pursuit of worldly treasure blinds us, and we know this, blinds us. We prioritize the acquisition of worldly possessions and risk losing sight of our spiritual purpose. Our hearts become consumed by the transient and fleeting pleasures of this world. How often do we buy something that we don't need? And why do we do that? We're looking to save this life for ourselves. And if I just have, you know, hey, that Amazon truck shows up, One more week. I can make it one more week. I'm going to get to the top of my company because I'm going to gain the world. I'm going to, I want to have the, the biggest house in my family because I'm going to gain the world. I'm going to have the most friends. I'm going to do the most things. I'm going to go to the most places. I got a map in the living room and it has the pins of all the places I've been. And I want people to see that, to know that I've been to all the places because I'm trying to gain the world. Now, is it wrong to travel? No. Is it wrong to move up in your company? Of course not. Is it wrong to be successful or to get a new phone if you need one? Or, right, like, are those things wrong or evil? No, they're not. But they will take over our souls without us even realizing it. In Luke 12, Jesus tells a parable about a rich man who wanted to gain the whole world. And so he built, he, he, he had all the grain, you know, so he built more 
uh, grain stalls to, to save up more grain and to be more wealthy, right? And then it says that God demanded his life one night and, and God says, okay, so what are you gonna do with all this wealth? Like you hoarded it, it was all yours, great. You ain't taking it with you. Like what did you do with it? It's worthless. Because like the rich man in the parable, all of us are gonna find ourselves at the end of our lives. You realize that? Some of us have the blessing, and I mean this, um, the blessing of knowing when that's gonna happen, right? Like it's, you know, it's a decline, right? But others of us, I mean, God forbid, but accidents happen on the way home from church. God forbid. But my point is, all of us come to that end. And what Jesus is saying here is, Many of us, verse 37, what can a man give in return for his soul? We, come, we might feel like we're going to come to the end of our lives saying, okay, I've got all this. I, I have, I've collected all. I lived life for me. So, so I can pay all this for my soul, right? There's a story of this British playwright. His name is William Somerset Maugham. And he was one of the most famous and accomplished playwrights in the early 20th century. British guy, and he was known for his decadent life, his lavish taste. He threw the best parties. Everyone wanted to go to his parties, right? The best food, best clothes. He had the villa on the Mediterranean that all the socialites just uh, uh, were envious of. I mean, the guy lived to the top. But his uh, nephew writes an article about him about the end of his life, And he described his uncle at the end of his life saying that he was an empty, bitter old man who repeatedly would fall into shrieking terrors, crying out, go away, I'm not ready, I'm not dead yet, I'm not dead yet, I tell you, go away. And William Moms had gained the whole world, but he had lost his soul. Now, again, one of the things that the Bible teaches us over and over and over again is the binary nature of devotion, A person is either devoted to the Lord or devoted to themselves in the world. And Joshua says to the people in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, choose this day whom you will serve. Elijah on Mount Carmel, they have the prophets of Baal who are trying to awaken Baal and and you have Yahweh and you have the sacrifices and obviously the fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice of Yahweh and the, the prophets of Baal are just completely obliterated. And Elijah says, choose this day. Whom you will serve. Jesus himself says, some of you are hot and some of you are cold. Pick one. And yet, if we're honest with ourselves, we live like there's this middle ground. We live as if there is this middle ground. But what does Jesus say? What are his words to us? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. There is no middle, I'm just trying to figure things out right now. There's a devotion to God in his way and there is a devotion to the world. And what's scary and the reality for all of us is that all of us have the propensity to live here. We live here. Because if we're honest about our lives, what are we pursuing? We're pursuing our way, not God's. We're not denying ourselves. We're not, we're not willing to take up our cross. And to live in surrender to God, it's just not happening. And that reality, do you know what it does? It ruins our rest. It ruins the rest of our souls. Because what we think to ourselves is, I'm not, I'm not denying myself. I never do. I don't want to pick up that cross. I'm not living in surrender. And I don't know about you, but this is where I feel so much of the time. And this destroys, this absolutely destroys the follower of Jesus having any rest in his or her life whatsoever. Unless, unless Jesus knew that would be the case when he gave us the invitation. 
unless when he gave the invitation to be his followers, he knew that it wasn't going to be our success that fueled our answer to the invitation, but his, but his. Do you remember a moment ago we talked about the the parable of the field, right? And what did we say about that? We said Jesus is the treasure in the field. Remember that? And that we see Jesus being the treasure in the field. And we say, that's what I want more than anything else. I want Jesus more than anything else. How do, I get, how do I get Jesus, this treasure? You get rid of everything else in your life. Ha, ah, okay, um, I can't do that. And Jesus says, I know. Because what if there's another side to that parable? What if, what if the treasure in the field is you? And Jesus gives everything in his life in order to acquire you. Do you realize that Jesus does not call us to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross, and to follow after him in obedience if he hasn't already done it himself? You know Jesus doesn't ask us to do things that he doesn't do already himself. You know that? When Jesus says to deny ourselves, you know Jesus is the perfect example of of one who denied himself. Paul tells us this in Philippians 2, that that he had, that it says that equality with God was not something that he that he grasped. And what that means is not, I always thought of that phrase like, oh, he's reaching out trying to grasp equality with God. No, what that means is he let it go. He let go of the comforts and securities of heaven and denied himself so that he could come and have the treasure. When he says to follow me in 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 100% surrender and obedience, you know that he was already 100% obedient to the Father in heaven. You know that? And when Jesus says, Father, not my will, but your will be done, no one followed the will of God better than Jesus Christ. I'll follow your will completely. I, I, I will follow you completely, Heavenly Father, so that I can have the treasure. And Jesus says, when he says to pick up your cross and follow me, you know he knew what he was saying. He knew that he would do it first and that his cross was the greatest burden that anyone has ever carried. What if the cost of discipleship isn't something that you pay so that you can do it. But what if the cost of discipleship was a price that was paid on our behalf so a disciple is something that we could become? Being a disciple is not a to-do list. It's an invitation. It's a pathway you know that Jesus gives us this pathway, this invitation, not to control and dictate and mitigate every little, every little detail of our life. You know Jesus says to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me because he wants to lead us into a better way of living. You know that? Because the best way of living is to say, I will deny myself so someone else can live, right? Right? I will suffer in dignity so that someone else could be lifted up. I will surrender myself completely to the Father because his will is best, and I want to follow after what he says, not mine. I want to live this life on his terms, not mine, because I trust, 
I trust that God knows what he's doing. And even though I don't understand all the time and I don't see all the time, I trust that when God asks me, commands me to do something, it is for his glory and my benefit. Jesus' invitation of discipleship is a pathway to lead us to deeper flourishing in this life. And guess what? That reality brings rest to your soul. Because when you look at the demands of Jesus in Mark chapter 8, and you understand that he's not asking me to do anything that he hasn't already done himself, and he's not measuring my ability to accomplish this, as uh, he's not seeing, okay, well, how well is Jason doing these things? God doesn't look at those and go, oh, well, he's, he's not really denying himself so much today. <laughs> Do you know what God is looking at? He's looking at the work of his son, Jesus Christ. Friends, you know your righteousness is not yours. It's Jesus. Do you know why you're accepted? Because God the Father looks at you and sees his son. Do you know why you're safe? Because God the Father sees his son standing next to you saying, don't worry, I got him. Do you know why you have hope? Because Jesus stands with us and points to the future that he bought and paid for us and says, this is where I'm taking you. Let's go on the journey together. The invitation of Jesus is to completely surrender ourselves to the Father. Why? Because Jesus did it first and he helps us to do the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, every single one of us in here, we are broken, we are fractured, our hearts, our souls, they war against you. We, so many of us, myself, at the front of the line, are paying the price of the world. For whatever reason, maybe, maybe we've been lied to and deceived by the enemy. Maybe we're deceiving ourselves. Maybe we just don't know. It's ignorance. I trust, though, God, that this invitation of surrender to you, of taking up our cross, I trust that it's better. I trust that it's better. And so my prayer is that every single person here who hears my voice, anyone who hears me now, I'm listening to my own voice, God, that we would trust in your work on the cross and knowing that your work is what makes us new and whole and clean, that that would give us a joy, a fire, an energy, an excitement to surrender ourselves to you. God, we love you. Thank you for this reality. Thank you that it exists. And thank you that it brings rest to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, amen.